why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Katie anything. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Ask Katie Anything. Um, yeah, today... If my computer is any indication of how my brain is, I have like 85,000 tabs open. Um, I am writing uh, my book about trauma and I'm talking about all sorts of things. Right now I'm in transgenerational trauma and holy shmamolies, you guys, it's been a lot. So thank you to everyone who sent in your uh, stories to be shared through Patreon. I know I haven't messaged you all back, but know that I have read them all. I'm trying to figure out ways to integrate them into the chapter in a thoughtful yet helpful manner. Um, Yeah, so it's been a lot. Here we are. It's already going to be July soon. This whole time, I still, and I don't don't think I'll do another video about it, but I don't know if you guys feel this way. I've still been having like a tough time just figuring out how to manage the coronavirus still, which I know people are like pretending that it doesn't exist and like, we're going back to normal. Things are open, but I'm like, no, nothing's changed. There's no vaccine. There's no treatment. We still don't really know much about it. Um, it keeps changing, blah, 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 blah. More and more of my friends and friends' parents are getting sick and it's not good. It's not good. Um, so stay home, stay safe. Wear your masks. Don't put it on your neck. Don't put it below your nose. Just wear a mask like you're supposed to wear a mask. Um, or get one of those neck gator things where you like pull it up. We sold, we uh, we have some for opinions that don't matter for Sean and I's podcast. We have those neck gaiters. It's like you can just wear it around um, and pull it up when you need it. Anyway, I'm rambling. But uh, yeah, this year has been crazy. And I can't believe it's going to be July. And it just feels like it's still, I don't know, January. Because <laughs> we're kind of like in this pause. Um, but anyway, I pulled your questions. If you're wondering if you're new here, um, hello. Welcome. Sorry, there's something in my eyeball. My name is Katie Morton. I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm licensed in the state of California. I uh, have had a YouTube channel for over eight and a half years uh, called Katie Morton, where I educate about all things related to mental health. Um, I actually specialize in eating disorders and self-injury work. That's like where most of my training came from. However, through my many years online, you know, and many colleagues who've graciously helped me out over the years, I talk about all sorts of things. Like I said, I'm writing a book about trauma. It's not my specialty, but I've been doing a lot of research. Like right now I'm reading about uh, epigenetics and epigenome and how that affects our DNA and how trauma affects epigenetics. You guys, it's all, it's all crazy. Um, But yes, I'm glad that you're here. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get into your questions. I have, I usually pull 10 of them and I think I have 10 this week. Yes, I just have 10, but some of them are like, you know me, I'm going to ramble. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it a lot. I can't help myself. So let's get into it. And my first question is, hey, Katie, is it normal to not want to tell your parents about anything that's going on in your life? I have really nice supportive parents. I just don't ever feel like I can open up to them and how um, about how I'm feeling or when I'm struggling. They ask me if I'm okay, And even if if I'm not, I lie and say I'm doing fine. And then I feel guilty about it. But I just can't bring myself to tell them the truth. And then I read below. So if you guys don't know, if a question is very similar to what you were wanting to ask, I always look in the comments below the question if you have something you want to add. So people add it in, you know, same, except my parents aren't supportive. Um, But I sometimes see people being open with their parents. I just can't understand why. And then someone also said they wanted to add, I'm sorry, there's something really in my eyeball. that's like kind of uncomfortable. Um, They wanted to add in, you know, uh, what about not being able to open up to friends and just in general, okay? And then someone talks about separation anxiety. So I'll get into that as well. So there's a lot within this question. Um, but the first thing, is it normal to not want to tell your parents anything that's going on in your life? I don't really like the word normal for people who have healthy, happy attachments, healthy, happy relationships with their parents. That isn't the norm, the the, the normal way to interact. We want them to know, we want to talk to them. They're part of our social support system. They're part of the, the people that we go to when we need a little extra insight and just understanding if we need to vent. Parents are part of that. Um, but I would be very, I'd be suspicious, don't be suspicious, um, but I would be very suspicious that maybe, um, even though your parents are really nice and supportive, maybe it wasn't in the way that you needed. I've talked about this in the past about like emotionally absent parents, that just because 
on paper, everything looks good. I have a whole video about this, the emotionally absent mother, or maybe it's emotionally absent parents. I forget what it's called. But anyways, it's look up Katie Morton, emotionally absent on YouTube. You'll find it. But I, I've always, uh, it can be tricky because being supportive doesn't always mean it's the right kind of support. We can have parents that look good on paper, right? They gave us a good home. They fed us. They listened to us. Um, they did all the stuff we needed, right? And everything should be good. And they paid for us to go to a good school or whatever, any number of things. We have such a big family. Everybody gets together. You know, why is, what's wrong with me? And we start to like internalize thinking something that is like we're broken. But support doesn't mean it's the right support. Uh, feeling like we have good parents doesn't mean that they're there for us emotionally in the way that we need. And so it could be a little bit of that, okay? So I just want to put that out there because like like always, I don't know because I haven't sat with you in sessions week after week for, you know, months to try to figure out what and ask a bunch of questions about like where this came from. Um, but that would be one of my first hypotheses, like, or hypotheses. Um, and I would want to like rule that out by asking you a bunch of questions about it. So there's that component, okay? So consider that. And then... Um, I want to also address the fact that some of us may have had like parents who are too supportive. Okay, so we talked about them being emotionally absent, but what if they're too involved? Like there was a, I forget this book that came out, but it was like tiger parents, I think they called it. But a lot of people call them like helicopter parents. And those are two versions of what I think is the same thing, which is when parents are just way too involved in their children's lives, that they think everything their child does is their business and every decision their child makes needs to be run through them. Now, tiger parents, I think it was called, are like, uh, I want to say it was saying how some parents are really, really tough on their their children. I think it was written by a Chinese woman who was saying how her father wanted her to be a doctor. Da, da, da. I could be wrong. You guys let me know in those comments if I'm remembering this wrong. But I, I feel like it was when I was in like high school that this came out. So it's a long time ago because I'm 36. Um, anyways, parents can be too involved meaning that we don't have any privacy. Privacy is important. It's part of development. It's part of us. Like, I think one thing that we don't talk enough about is when we're growing up, we uh, have a period of time, usually around middle school. This is why middle school sucks so much for us and our parents is when we're teenagers, we push boundaries. And what that means is that we are seeing just how far we can go in life. This isn't just with our parents. This can be with friends and boyfriends, girlfriends, people, uh, teachers, all sorts of things, coaches, we'll push boundaries to see how far we can go. It's almost our way of like fine, like stretching our arms out and seeing what we can get away with in life before we, you know, learn how to regulate our emotions and become an adult and like live, you know, well, we just, we are testing it out. It's almost like, we're like, okay, this was fine, but is this okay? What about this? You know, and we'll see until someone says stop. And so, I think that that time in our life can be a very private time. If we're a teenager um, or even a young adult, we can just be like, that's none of your beeswax or whatever, or none of your business, whatever you want to say. Um, and I think that that's kind of a normal part of development. So all of it, a lot of it depends on how old you are and kind of the way that your parents have been so quote unquote supportive. Do we feel like they're not giving us what they, we needed, even though they're around, it's not in the way that we wanted? Or do we think that they're, like too involved where they're like everywhere and we're like, oh, it just, we want to push them out. Think about those things. And then I want to get into the the add-ons. So someone said same, except my parents aren't supportive. Um, and I think when our parents aren't supportive, if they're not around, they're abusive, um, they're just, uh, maybe they're so caught up in their own shit. They like forget they have kids. There's a lot of parents out there that should never have had children. Um, those, that's very obvious to the reason why you don't want to tell them because um, why would why would you? They're never there. So you wouldn't want to let them know about it. And they don't even, I know that from my viewers and patients alike, you guys have told me you can feel like your parents don't even know you. And so that could be the case. You're like, they don't even know me. So why would I tell them what's going on? Like, I don't even know how to talk to them. They don't even listen to me. And that would make sense too. But then someone said not being able to open up to friends and just in general. And I think a lot of us struggling to open up is the discomfort with vulnerability. And I know, like, even personally, I struggle with this, everybody struggles with it, to to allow ourselves to, to be represented as our true self, what we're really going through, things aren't fine, we're not good, or okay, 
we might be having a shit time to, to call it out, to show it, to express it can be really uncomfortable because by showing and expressing and being ourselves, being our raw, vulnerable self leaves us open for potential hurt. And so for a lot of us to ensure that we don't get hurt, we shut that out. We don't talk about it. We stuff it deep. We forget about it. Or we just do the fine. We always say we're fine, right? And so opening up to people, I encourage all of you out there who struggle to open up to anyone, if you're feeling like parents, friends, anybody in general, pick one person and slowly open up. I don't want you to any of you to think that like when I'm talking about opening up and telling people what's going on in your life, like you don't have to go from zero to 100. It doesn't have to be you tell them nothing to like you tell them every deep, dark secret. Okay, but this needs to be like slow and steady. Like we start off by telling them that like, yeah, you kind of had a shitty day the other day and you felt kind of depressed. Okay, maybe we share that little bit. Or maybe we just share that we just had a rough day because our boss was mean or our friend was rude or something. It's just very minimal. And then we see how they do. We see how they respond. Are they caring? Are they supportive? Do they listen? Do they make it all about them? How does this go? If it keeps going positively, if they keep listening, reflecting, uh, validating our experience, uh, seeking to support, those are all good signs. So then we can open up more, right? Then we can share a little bit more and a little bit more. And so just little by little, that's the best way to do it. Um, Because otherwise, the truth about it is that then we don't truly know ourselves and no one else does either. We can kind of like, I don't know, turn it in on ourselves. And we know that's not good. Any kind of upset, anger, angst turned inwards turns into depression, anxiety. I want you all to have a safe person, at the very least, to vent what's what's happening, how you're feeling, all of that. It's really, really important. And then the final part of this question, the person that said, just uh, talked about separation anxiety and how they struggled going when they were like a baby from zero to five years old, they said. How if their parents left them at the daycare, they'd cry, they weren't easily soothed, all of that stuff. Um, I have a video about separation anxiety if you want to learn more about what that is, but it has to do with attachment and us not feeling safe to be separated from our caregiver. This can happen for a variety of reasons. So watching that video will help you kind of hear about all the ways that it can happen. Um, That is, it can be very difficult when we have separation anxiety, it can be very difficult for us to then open up to our parents because like I said, it can have something to do with attachment. Separation anxiety can be Um, let's say a parent's going through a divorce or you move, there's a big like trauma or a change in your life. Um, We can fear being away from them because we might not be safe. They might not be safe. It's kind of a protective thing, um, either for ourselves, like self-preservation or uh, family preservation. And so, of course, opening up to them, tell them what's going on in our life can make us, uh, it can make it even more difficult, right? Because we how do I explain this in a very concise way? It's like, okay, if our parents, if we never felt safe without our parents, that means we don't really feel safe in ourselves. And so we might not even really know what's going on for us. And we wouldn't want to upset our parents by telling them, does that make sense? I know that sounds crazy. But in my experience, that's kind of where it comes from. It's like, if we always felt this kind of anxiety around our parents and being separated from them and that didn't really leave any room for like emotional connection in the way maybe we weren't being soothed in the way that we needed. Maybe we didn't know how to soothe ourselves and they weren't really helping kind of back to the beginning when I was like, if they're not really there for you in the way that you needed, we don't know if we can really trust them or trust the environment. And so it can make it harder to open up because opening up uh, in and of itself means that we feel safe and okay. And maybe we don't. I hope that that helps. There's a lot to that. And there's a lot of like questions I still have in ways that then I could better maybe answer this. Um, but hopefully it gives you some something to think about, something to process, and maybe just a couple little seeds that could help sprout into, um, you know, the helpful solution that you're looking for. Okay, moving right along. Question number two it says, Hi, Katie. Ever since childhood, I've had a difficult time crying in front of others. Kind of similar to that the question uh, that we just read, right? I don't like showing my tears to other people since I want others to view me as strong instead of weak. Such a bad assumption to make. Crying actually doesn't mean make us weak at all. I tend to be strong for others. How can I allow myself to be vulnerable with others? Okay, so a couple things. If it's happened ever since childhood, is there trauma in in your past? Big T's, little T's. Um, I've talked about this, um, uh, I don't know, probably on the podcast, but at least on my channel. And I'm writing about it in my book. Um, 
trauma doesn't always look the way that we think it's going to look. A lot of people think that trauma is like a car crash, a, a, a death in the family, abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, things you see, things you feel, um, being in a, a war or uh, being a refugee. We think of things like that. that. We think, oh, those are traumas. No, those are big T traumas, meaning that one exposure to that thing could lead to PTSD symptoms. However, what we don't talk enough about are little T traumas, meaning like parents got divorced. We had to move twice that year. Um, I was bullied for a little bit, you know, and bullying can be a big T, by the way. I'm just saying like I was bullied a little bit for like a couple of months and then I don't know, they stopped. Somebody else took their attention. And then, um, I don't know, I'm trying to think, but other, other things that are little and little, I don't mean to minimize or, or downplay what's happened. I'm just saying that in and of themselves, if just one of those things just happened, our resiliency would kick in for most of us. It's like, uh, the way that Alexa explained it, that'll be in the book is they're like waves and we can have this huge crashing wave that just overcomes us and we are uh, we can't get up for air and that would be a big t right oh my god i was in a plane crash and every time i close my eyes i still feel like i'm there and i just can't you know and we can have survivor's guilt there can be all sorts of shit but that wave has like pulled us under and we have ptsd but then there's these little waves that maybe hit us first up to our knees and we're like, oh, I can keep walking in the water. I'm totally fine. I'm not, I'm not under the water. This is whatever. This is kind of nice. It's fine. Our resiliency kicks in, right? We keep moving forward in life. We're fine. Then the wave hits again. Maybe it's a little up to our waist. Ooh, that one's hard. Ooh. But then if the one at our, our coming up to our knees and to our waist happen at the same time, we're underwater again. And so it's like all these little waves keep hitting and we just can't catch our breath. We can't get above the water. We can't fight back. It slowly pulls us under. And so that's what I mean, not minimizing it. It's more just like the buildup versus having like one instance. Neither are worse or better than the other. It's all just forms of trauma. And so I wonder if there were small traumas in your life. And that's why it's difficult for you to cry in front of others. I also am very curious and my, my gut reaction to this is, uh, are you a parentified child? Because you said you wanted others to view you as strong instead of weak. And that's why like trauma, parentified children, that's like the, I make I make little notations under the questions um, so that I like, what am I thinking? What, what gut reaction did I have when I read this question? And those are my two, trauma, parentified child. And if you don't know what a parentified child is, it's when we're young and our parent relies on us to be another parent. This could mean that emotionally we support our parent. They could tell us all sorts of things about their dating life or the relationship with their, you know, mother, father, um, or relationship with your mother or father, I mean, like that, their spouse um, or ex-spouse or whatever. They tell you all sorts of things they shouldn't about their sex life, stuff like that. We don't, that's not appropriate. Or they rely on you to do things around the house. So let's say you go to school during the day and you're like 10 years old and you come home and you not just have to do chores because... Every child should have to do chores, by the way. But you come home and you're like responsible for the other children in your family and you make sure that you feed them all. You make sure everybody gets up in time for school. Like your parent isn't doing the things and so you have to do it. So you become an adult way too young. Um, and that is that can be a parentified child. And so what that really does is rob us of our childhood, makes us feel like it's not okay to, we don't have the time and space to grow and develop at the pace that we should. We're like rushed. And so a lot of times people who are parentified children can fi wake up sometimes, and I say wake up, but like all of a sudden become aware this happened or feeling they'll have like midlife crises and stuff like that. I think that's really where this comes from is like not giving yourself the time and the space to grow and develop at the pace that you were ready to do. And you didn't make choices thoughtfully and take your time. You like sped through things and all of a sudden you're like, holy fuck, I'm like 50 years old and I don't like anything about my life. Like what? Um... I know that's like ripple effect, but I'm just, I'm just, I'm just talking it out with you because that's, that's honestly where I believe that stuff kind of comes from. I think it's born out of this parentified child, not always, but a lot of the time. Um, and so the person who asked this question, how can I allow myself to be vulnerable to others? I think part of it is potentially figuring out where this came from. Is it trauma based? Is it a bunch of little T's? Is it parentified child? Did you never get a chance to be a kid and cry and throw fits and be sad and, and learn like, 
have emotional development. I think a lot of us who've been traumatized or were parentified as children never had the chance to develop our emotions healthfully. So we don't even know what that looks like. So of course you're like, I can't cry in front of other people. I don't even understand what's going on in me. And like, we just stuff it down. So consider that. And I think healing that part of yourself is the the first and best step in the right direction. And I think the allowing yourself to be vulnerable with others starts off kind of back to that first question that I answered where they, you know, we're talking about like opening up. Find one person, could be a therapist, could be a, a best friend, could be a parent or something like that. Whoever feels safe for you, pick one person and slowly start sharing. It doesn't mean you have to cry in front of them right away. I, I, Therapy is a great place to to try out the crying. I know that sounds weird, but therapy is a safe place to do it if, if you want that to. Um, but I think just slow and steady, getting to know people, talking it out, sharing little by little, not feeling rushed. We don't have to dump everything. Um, yeah, because we can be strong for others, but sometimes we need other people to be strong for us. We can't always be the one that's the strength, right? Um, but little by little opening up, not all or nothing. Let's not do this black and white, like not crying at all. And then crying like every day, all day. Um, also don't worry that that's going to happen because truthfully, our emotions are not built like that. The only reason we would continue to cry day after day, after day, day after day is because we're allowing ourselves to like spiral into a pit of despair, ruminating on those thoughts and feelings, not allowing them to be just what they are, thoughts and feelings, recognizing them, identifying them, and letting them move on. Um, Yeah, I I think I answered that fully (laughs) all over the place as, as per usual. Okay, you guys, question number three. Hey, Katie, just wondering how therapists hide their emotions, so much about emotions this month. It's or this month, this week. It's funny how we have themes. I've said this on my Patreon live streams, how uh, every month we tend to have themes and the questions. And I'd say this week is a lot about emotions and expressing emotions. Okay. Anyway, question number three says, hey, Katie, just wondering how therapists hide their emotions during session. Hmm, Good question. For example, if a client mentions something that is hard to hear details about or shocking, and your mind is thinking, what the fuck? How do you keep your face from showing what your immediate reaction is or what you're thinking? I love listening to you and have taught me so much. You've been a real blessing during COVID. Thank you. Of course, you're very, very welcome. I really enjoyed the like, you know, when your mind is thinking, what the fuck? Um, A couple of things like therapy is different. So sometimes we can hide our emotions. Sometimes we can't. Some people in the comments below this question actually said that their therapist like teared up when they were talking about a really difficult thing. And that that's happened to me. Um, I had a patient of mine years ago share about the abuse she sustained from her father and like she was bawling and and I teared up. It was really hard to hear. Um, yeah, cause, cause we care, right? We get into this line of work because we care about people and to see someone hurting and recalling a really horrendous, uh, experience or situation in life can be really, really difficult. Um, but when it comes to being in therapy, a, a lot of it, it, it's it's different. And I'll do my best to explain. Let me know if you want me to re-answer this question because this is tricky. But what we do is instead of, unlike a regular conversation where I am listening to you and just absorbing what you're telling me and empathizing with your situation possibly, or I don't know, like just taking it all in, a therapist is looking for patterns we're looking for symptoms. We're looking for um, language that you use when you describe it. It's a little bit more of a, I don't even want to call it scientific because that sounds very cold. And that's not what I mean. But it's, we're viewing stories through a different lens than like a friend or family member would. And, and that can be hard for people. Sorry, now my eye is itching. Life is difficult today. Um, but that can be difficult for people who aren't in the therapy realm to understand because it can sound, like I said, very cold, very calculated. But a lot of that really helps um, us be better therapists. So um, when someone's telling me a story, I'm trying to, first of all, remain present and hold the space for them, let them know that it's safe and okay. And I'm checking for signs of dissociation. So that's one thing. So my brain's already split into two where I'm kind of listening and, and noticing their body language, but I'm also trying to make sure that they're making eye contact or that they're you know, they're not frozen, that there's some movement in their hands or feet, like normal people, like, you know, tap their toe or 
you know, we fidget, we just gesticulate with our hands. There could be a lot of different things that I'm looking for to make sure they're still present. Um, also, then I'm then I'm trying to pair it with things that I already know. So like if they're telling me about the fact that their father was like emotionally abusive for three years, I'm trying to think of how they've talked about their father in the past and like what behavior. So I'm, I'm kind of plugging the information in. It's almost like adding it to an already existing program and meaning like a computer program and and seeing if anything kind of fits or makes something make more sense or, or fit together better, or work better, things like that. Um, yeah, and then practice. I mean, there are things that patients have told me over the years that like you think you've heard it all and then you you hear something else, like anything from weird sexual fetishes to, um, I mean, that one really, there's been ones that got me there, but even like uh, things that their parents said and did that I'm like, oh my God, there are people like that exist in the world. Um, or, you know, anything like that. And so I really think that we, we work really hard to not, because we want to remain like in school, we're taught to remain kind of, I don't know what the word is. I forget the word they use, but it's like you offer unconditional positive regard, meaning like you're supportive, you're, you're positive. You're not judging your patient, you're, you're listening and you're there. And then you don't want to insert your own shit, like essentially be like counter transference. Um, you don't want to insert, insert your own shit into sessions. So that means that my reaction on my face and my body language can in turn affect you and change how helpful therapy is. And so one of my classes was just about practicing different therapeutic techniques, like um, act, not some of it was role play, but a lot of it was like writing out like scripts essentially of how you would respond. Like she would give us a scenario of a patient. We would have to tell her how we would how we would respond to that. And so there's a lot of facets to it. Number one, just to recap, because I definitely rambled. Number one is like, we're looking for different things than, than you'd be looking for in a normal conversation. Number two, um, we have to keep our own shit out of it. So we have to like, we don't want to give anything to that. And three, we're trained to not add our own shit to it. So, so there are layers to, to how we keep it out of session, but that doesn't always happen. Like I said, I've teared up before. Many of you in the comments said that your therapist has teared up before and it was really validating. Um, no one said that it was something that was upsetting, but, um, it's not something that happens very often either. Um, so yeah, I think we were there to help. So we're not there to judge. And I think that's just a different, that in and of itself makes it different, right? If you're just listening to someone trying to understand them, even if they tell you something that you're like, oh my God, seriously? Like, you know, we all know, even as I said that, that that isn't helpful. So we're gonna not express that. So I think a lot of it for me is just like, seeking to understand, asking them how it felt to talk about it, like just being there to hold the space, not putting my own judgment or shit into it because, um, yeah, because it's not a place for that. I hope that that makes sense. Okay. Question number four it says, hi, Katie, do you have any advice for people who find it hard to accept that there are things we have no control over, especially the future? This is something that I've um, that I've struggled with since I was really young, and I would panic all the time about it. I don't know how to accept that things will happen and that there's nothing that I can do about it. Thank you for everything you do. Of course, thank you for being part of the community and all of your support. Um, the uh, When I read this question, there was a lot, This all of these got a lot of thumbs ups, like in the hundreds. This one, um, a lot of people were like, oh, I'm so glad that it's not just me. So the truth about it, and you're, you're, you're not going to like this, but is not allowing your brain to fucking take you down a, a shitty road. When we ruminate and worry about things we have no control over, like the future, th first of all, that's anxiety. That's an anxiety disorder. I'm not sure which one yet. Um, but if you have panic attacks, could be part of panic disorder. It could just be generalized anxiety disorder. And I didn't say just generalized anxiety disorder because it's any less than. I'm just saying that people can have generalize anxiety disorder and have panic attacks and then be diagnosed with panic disorder. You get you following? Um, so it could be those, but it's definitely an anxiety disorder. But we also can try some thought stopping techniques and we can try um, like journaling. I know you guys, you knew it was coming, that J-bomb. Um, journaling so helpful to get that out. 
um, because you're we're, what, what's happening is our brain is running away with its thoughts and worries, and we're we're like passengers. We're not taking an active role, which I know it can be hard, and that's why I want you to know that it's an it it's part of an anxiety disorder. So medication and anxiety treatment through therapy, like CBT techniques, are super super helpful for those with, of us with anxiety. Um, and CBT is cognitive behavioral therapy, if you're wondering. Um, so those techniques help us recognize the thoughts we're having, recognize the beliefs behind them and the behaviors that come out of it and helps us change that. So it usually starts with like your thoughts, like you, you track your thoughts and then you work to make them, you know, more positive because of the thoughts, our thoughts become our beliefs and our behaviors and just kind of choo, 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 choo. Uh, it's all, it's all a cycle. And it really goes, I think, it, I feel like there's four stops and I'm missing it, but it's like thoughts, uh, behaviors, beliefs, thoughts, behaviors, beliefs. But if there's one more, you guys, and I'm forgetting it, you let me know in those comments. Um, Cause this is just off the top of my head, but I really think that this is anxiety. Um, and I would encourage you to get some support around that because um, like you said, you don't have control over it. And that's what worry is like uncontrollable worry. Uh, worry doesn't, help us do anything it doesn't it, worry doesn't cause us you know when it's like this we have no control over the future so that kind of worry and thought process that isn't suited it isn't like serving us in any way it's actually hindering us it's not helping we can't prepare we don't know what to prepare for it, it's just wasting our time wasting our brain space and making us more upset and so things that you can do today First of all, like the anxiety, please see a therapist, please see a psychiatrist. Me medication can be really, really helpful for stuff like this, um, as well as, like I said, a CBT-based therapist could be great. Um, but something you can do today is just notice your thoughts and start tracking those. I am sure that these worry thoughts, they're probably like five or 10 that you have all the time. And as you start tracking your thoughts, maybe write down two to five a day for a little while and you'll start to see a pattern. Um, you can also just Google a thought tracker and I think it just already has it. Like you can print it out if, if you're one of those people and you can like write it in. That's how I am. Um, I like to write things out. It just makes me feel better. So that can be real helpful. Journaling like a bullet journal or a five minute journal. You'll start to see patterns in the way that you think and patterns in the way that you're processing things. Um, because I think I talked about this in a video recently. I forget which one, but um, it's really, uh, I think it's like 90 something percent of the thoughts that we have every day, which I think we on average have like 60,000, uh, are the same. They're repeat thoughts. So we got to work on those. So notice what your repeat thoughts are. And then use bridge statements to turn them into more positive ones. Use thought stopping techniques to stop the ones that just run away. And we can't, you know, we end up in like a really dire, depressive state. Um, yeah, and then get some help, get some professional help. Um, because if it's been happening, because they said it's been, I struggled with this since I was really young. Chances are other people in your family have anxiety and you have it too. Um, and you said you panic about it all the time. So get some support, uh, be assessed by a psychiatrist. Medication can really help you, help you if you're interested in that. Um, but yeah, it does get better. It can go away. We just have to find some tools and techniques that work for us. But thought stopping, thought tracking, all of that's very important. Bridge statements, all good. Okay. Question number five, Katie, do you hug your clients? I actually have a, well, I don't know if I have a video about this. I think I do. I think if you, if you YouTube Katie Morton hug clients, it'll come up. Um, it says I've been receiving trauma therapy for past abuse with the transference of my therapist. I wish so much she could be my mom and hold me in her arms. However, my therapist refused to give me a hug or even hold my toy rabbit because she didn't want to confuse my child part that she's my mom. She didn't want to re-traumatize me by giving me false hope. She hopes that I, the adult part, can be the one who hugs my child part instead. Mm -hmm. Each time with her rejection, and it's quote unquote rejection, I feel so pain, uh, pain filled that my wish will never be fulfilled. I also really hate myself. Um, who is who is already an adult, always wanting a mom? Katie, is being my own mother the only way out? What should I do in the face of such an attachment cry? I am reluctant to have physical contact with people normally, but I just crave for such physical intimacy with her. This is really tricky. So to answer the first part of the question, yes, I do hug clients on occasion, um, probably only one time. Uh, usually it's, 
when they're like graduating from seeing me, like they're going to end therapy or, you know, they've done some really hard work and the day has been really, I don't know, like the session's been really difficult and they just needed some extra support and they asked for it. However, just like your therapist, think wanting your therapist to be your mom and wanting them to hold you in your arms and be your parent is not healthy. And it actually can cause more damage than, or more harm than good, I guess, to put it frankly. Um, and I don't even know if it's like giving false hope, like she said, but you, we cannot, uh, and I, I know this is painful to hear and I'm sorry, but we cannot, as children who've had shitty fucking parents who left us with these voids where we have uh, where we wanted love, affection, and nurturing, and we got nothing, or we were abused. When when our childlike self never got the love and support that it needs, we cannot, at an, as an adult trying to heal that, look for someone else to feel to fill that void. Okay, we can't. I know we want to, and that urge is fucking strong because it was supposed to be given to us by another person, but the person who can give it to us didn't, and the time has passed. Okay? So that when we're primed for attachment as a child, that is for our primary caregiver. We know this through science and research. It, you can easily Google and find some Google Scholar articles to support this. But we're primed for it and it's for our primary caregiver and we form our attachment within the first year of our life. They say the first year is super super important and some now have opened it up to say like the first 5 years are very vital. But let's just, we'll just, for the sake of argument for right now, we'll just say the first year of our life is super important. And if we did not get that and we were traumatized as a child, we as an adult are actually the only one that can give our child what it needs now. And it's not really being your own mother. I, I kind of, I don't even know, the more I think about it, and the more I talk to you guys about it, this whole remothering, reparenting, it, it's a tricky, I don't even like the words. I feel like we need to come up with a better phrase for it because what it is is not reparenting or being your own mother. It's actually giving yourself what your parent didn't give you and giving it to them now. Like, you know what I mean? Giving it to them now. So it's like, I know that that sounds not, I don't know, not good or not satisfying, but that's what it is. It's like we uh, have to talk to the child of us. All of us, traumatized or not, attachment issues or not, we all have a child part of ourselves. He, she, they still exist, okay? They are always around and they're kind of part of our, part of our personality, part of who we are. And we, as adults, as healthy adults, give them stuff all the time. We can engage with our childlike self and goof around with our loved ones at, I don't know, whether it's like we go to an amusement park or we uh, chase around our kids and goof with them or our partner. Um, we can do all sorts of little things that are very childlike, right? We can play games. We can get really competitive. We can race around the house. We can do all sorts of things that are very childlike. And I'd encourage all of us to engage more with our child self. However, when it comes to trauma, we we have to do more work with that child self because that child self is still fearful, is still alone, is still traumatized. And so I know I'm off on a tangent, but I just don't like the phrasing of like being your own mom or reparenting. I think it's more about like getting better, getting more in touch with your childlike self and working with them with the tools you have as an adult to help them heal. And so that's why I always start with my patients in the the letter writing where we write letters to our childlike self from our adult self and vice versa so that we can engage in that conversation with our child self that maybe we've never talked to. Um, and we try to just pretend it doesn't exist. A lot of people who've been through traumas, um, it kind of can swing one or one of, I guess it can kind of go to both extremes, but by and large, people who've been traumatized, uh, and like have never been in touch with their childlike self act very serious. They have a very difficult time loosening up or having a good time relaxing a lot of people in their life probably told them all the time, God, you got to relax, have a good time. Don't worry about that right now. Let's do this. Let's have fun. Probably all the time you're told that. On the flip side, some of us who have really bad attachment issues and struggle and you know, our inner child is really hurting um, 
can seem all strict and have it all together. But then if someone triggers us in any way, we act like a child. We can be very uh, petty and name call and uh, be passive aggressive and do things that children would do to fight with someone um, if they were upset. And so anyway, it's important that we get in touch with that childlike self so that it can be integrated. It shouldn't be one or the other. We shouldn't be super, super serious or super, super childlike. We should be this like fused, healthy, happy adult. Um, does that make sense? I feel like I'm really all over the place with this one and I apologize, but I'm glad your therapist did this. I don't think that, I think that everything your therapist is doing is great because otherwise the attachment issues will just become even more pervasive for you. Meaning that's like runs through more and more of your life. I would encourage you to start <clears throat> communicating with that child like you instead of thinking that you have to be your own mother Let's think of adult you coming in to save childlike you and help them heal. Because when they were when we're children, we don't have the tools. We don't have the emotional uh, intelligence to even begin that process. And so anyways, all of that to say that it's not just being your own mother. It's, it's using the tools we have now to help us heal um, so that we aren't still looking for other people to put into that hole. Because I can tell you, I'm just going to be honest here. I think anybody who's struggling with this needs to hear this. Even if your therapist held you or held your toy rabbit, I can 100% guarantee that you it will not be enough. It won't be good. You will struggle with boundaries with your therapist. You'll try to call and email and text all the time and you will be re-traumatized. So it's really unhealthy. Um, and that's why your therapist is holding that boundary and I'm glad that they are. And I know that's hard to understand. But like I said, Another person will not be filling that void that actually does not heal or help in the way that I know we feel. But what will help is us getting back in touch with that child self, talking to them, understanding them, offering support, guidance, tools, resources, so that we can feel okay and not like we, I don't know, like reaching out for any kind of connection to save us from like falling off the cliff. We, we have all the tools. It's almost like, I guess the best analogy, because I love like visual analogies, the best analogy would be, and it's because I've been watching Space Wars, silly, silly show, is like we're floating out of the space station and we are attached. We have that attachment thing to the space station. However, we don't know that it's there and we feel completely isolated and alone and we're freaking out and we're spinning which could cause us to make it worse where we bust off. But we have all the tools to fix that too, but we just aren't accessing it. Does that make sense? It's like we have all the resources. We're, we are connected. We are going to be okay. Nothing bad is going to happen to us. We just have to access those tools. It's like even if our little rope was like unraveling, we're like freaking out trying to holler for someone else to give us their rope or to save us when we have the, the ability to just touch it, you know, touch it and work on it and, and get it back connected. I hope, I don't know if that makes sense, but I've been watching a lot of space shows. Um, so yeah, it's like, even if that cord is getting cut, we, we have the ability to, to mend it. Um, and we're the only one that can mend it. It's like, nobody else has those tools. We have all the tools that our space station has for mending that. Um, I don't know if that's sinking in with you guys, but let's move on. <laughs> Sometimes the analogies are good and some they haven't had time to form in my brain. Okay. Question number six. As a psychology student, as well as a patient with complex PTSD and OSDD, um, I'm not sure what OSDD, I should have looked that up. You guys let me know what OS, or let me just look it up really quick. I didn't, um, I am not 100% sure. Otherwise specified dissociative disorder. Okay, cool. So complex PTSD and dissociation, we'll just say that for some simplicity's sake. I wonder if I can ever be competent in being a therapist. As you know, traumatic stress in childhood has a profound and ingrained impact on the brain and body. I feel like I am fundamentally flawed and handicapped because of the past abuse. For example, I have poor boundaries, transference on mother figures, hypervigilant to others, negative emotions, despite how much awareness or coping skills I have. I'm also worried if my desire to be a helping professional comes from my wish of rescuing myself. Katie, when can I know if I'm ready to help others? Do you really think a traumatized person can ever be competent to be a therapist? Okay. So there's a lot in this. First of all, this is like riddled with shame. And I know shame comes along with abuse, but that whole like, uh, I'm fundamentally flawed. I'm handicapped because of past, you know, 
that's not true. That's your shame speaking. And I would encourage you to, to tap into that, to listen to that, to, to, to pay attention to that. Um, oh, my phone just went off. Sorry. I didn't silence it. I forgot. Um, anyways, I think that, uh, first of all, yes, you can be a therapist, even if you've had trauma in the past. And I know I saw in the comments below this post that they were like, you know, Katie's talked about this and said, like, as long as you get your own shit together, you're fine. Um, and neuroplasticity, it's a thing. And also the ingrained impacts on the brain and body, like how trauma affects our epigenetics, which is like how our DNA is read. Uh, also nurturing healthy relationships affect our epigenetics and can make and like in turn change it back. So like undo the trauma um, I guess the effects that the trauma had on that. So yes, it can be undone. It's not forever. We're not forever like scarred by this. It's not going to ruin everything for us. And so as long as we're working on our own shit, it's totally fine. Um, being aware of th things that you struggle with, like boundaries and transference and things like that, those will be things that you'll have to manage. I would encourage you as you become a therapist to always continue in your own therapy and I love one of the my favorite things is having like a peer support group. That, it's just once a month we get together for an hour. It's during the lunch hour. Super easy. It's in I have my happens to be in my same building, um, although we're not doing it right now because COVID. Um, but getting together with other clinicians to talk out any issues you're having and to be like you can say like, hey, as you guys know, like I struggle with like transference of this or boundaries and like, does this rub you guys the wrong way or is it just me? And that can be a great way for you to like bounce ideas. Having colleagues, like my friends, I have uh, tons of friends, like my friend Rocio, Abba, Alexa. They're all therapists um, with different uh, specialties and different resources. And I, I call on them a lot when I need some insights and helpful, you know, help. Um, so, and then, so yes, you can be a therapist. Don't let your traumatic stress in childhood ruin your whole life. You can move past it. Don't let shame pull you down and you know, silence you, uh, recognize that shame. And uh, really the best way to come out of shame is like vulnerability, which seems so opposite of what we want to do, but like courage, vulnerability. Um, at Brené Brown talks a lot about that and it's it's a beautiful, very difficult, but yet beautiful thing that we can do for ourselves. Um, and then I'm worried that if my desire to be a helping professional comes from my wish of rescuing myself, it could, it could be, uh, there's a difference. There's a difference if we wanted to get into therapy to figure our shit out. That's wrong, okay? I'm just putting it out there. It's wrong. But we can get into therapy because we wish someone had helped us when we were a child, and so we want to be that for someone else. That's fine. That's healthy. That's good. We get into our, um, our career because we want to help other people. That's beautiful. That's wonderful. Um, even the, I've been reading a lot of trauma stuff, so forgive me, but Dr. Nadine Burke Harris, who is the Surgeon General of California, um, our first ever, and she was traumatized as a child. Her mom was schizophrenic. She had a really, really rough upbringing. Um, and she, you know, she's been doing a ton of research and support around uh, ACEs and the ACE study and trauma and stuff like that. So yeah, you you can totally do whatever you want. And she's a pediatrician. She's not a mental health professional. But I, she's written books and done TED Talks on trauma. She is pushing for more assessment of children um, of ACEs so that we can offer more resources to them. So I just want you to know that, like, just because we have trauma in the past doesn't mean we can't be a, a helpful and wonderful therapist or other other health professional. Um, so yes, I really do think that a traumatized person can be competent to be a therapist, but we just have to manage our own shit just like anybody else. And so the fact that you're working on it, um, is great. Keep working on it. And you'll notice maybe for a while it's, it, you know, you'll make sure that you're taking on patients that you can help. Do not hesitate to refer people out. Like, um, for instance, one of my colleagues, uh, had a horrific divorce years ago. They're much older. They're like in their sixties now, maybe late fifties, but they had a horrific divorce because they're, uh, their partner had bipolar disorder and was an alcoholic and things just really unraveled for, um, for her. And it was really difficult. And so for a long time, if she had any bipolar patients or patients who were alcoholics, she would refer them to me or other colleagues because she was like, I just can't, I'm too close to this right now. I'm not in my right, like the, tr the counter transference would be intense. And so I say that to you that like recognize your limitations. We all have our own limitations, whether it's specialty or just our ability to keep our own shit out of it. Everybody has that, but we have to recognize it 
and then refer out. We have to do what's right for our patients. Um, and that's why, because you're wanting to, you have to get into doing the, the work because you want to help other people, that will always ensure that you're putting your patients first. Um, you're going to be great. And I do think having your own experience in life, good, bad, and different, helps you be a better therapist, especially being on the other side. If a therapist has never been in their own therapy, I'm like, mm, thank you, next. You know, like, I'm not interested. I need you to know that you know what it's like to bear your soul to cry in, in session, to be exhausted after. To, you need to know how uncomfortable this is. Um, so yeah, so there's that. Okay, moving on to question number seven. There are a lot of great questions this month. Um, hopefully we'll get through them all here because um, I have to get ready because I'm about to have our Patreon live stream. Whoop, whoop. Okay. Question number seven says, does being sexually abused when you were younger change your preferences? I had something happen to me when I was nine and now I'm in my early 20s. I've known for a few years now that, um, that I like and am attracted to women way more than men. I recently came out to someone who knows my past and they keep telling me that I'm not gay that I like being with women more because it's more safe. Any advice? Also, any advice on coming out when you know you're, you know everyone in your family would be accepting but one and knowing that you can lose the most important activity in your life because it's a faith-based thing? Oh, man, churches need to come around because they're fucking stupid. Okay, there's, there's so many facets to the LGBT community and sexuality. And I just want everyone out there to know that however you feel, whatever you think is perfectly fine. And it's not up to anybody else to tell us any different. Okay. I know I'm rambling, but that's really the point that I want to get across is that sexuality is this entire spectrum. And wherever you lie on that spectrum is 100% okay. You be you, you love who you want to love. You have relationships with people you want to have relationships with. Um, and then back to this person's question. Sorry, I get off on tangents, you guys, but being sexually abused can change your preferences because of the safety. I have had, I have had clients in the past, you guys, I'm just tell, telling you my experience, who, because they were sexually assaulted or abused as a child by a male, this was a female at the time, by a male, that men were very, very scary to her for a long, long time. And so for a while, she thought that she was a lesbian. And then as working through processing through trauma, she realized she was bisexual. That's just one example. So I do believe that it can affect your preferences. But as you work on that trauma and work to heal, um, you know, you can come back around to, to whatever because you might and we all might move along the spectrum. Like, don't think that just saying that you're that you're gay or that you're straight or that you're bisexual is like set in stone. Once I come out, I can never change how I think or feel or love or whatever. Mm -mm, that's bullshit, too. Don't believe that. Um, but I don't think that sexual abuse equals a change sexual preference. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in some cases it can, it can affect it. Um, but at the end of the day, you know you best because you said, um, you know, you've known for a few years that you're attracted to women way more than men. That's just your preference. That's completely okay and healthy. That's totally fine and normal. Is it because of your sexual abuse? It, it could be, it could not be. Does it really matter? It's your sexual preference. I know that people want like a answer like, oh, did this cause this? everybody's different. But it sounds to me that I don't like the fact that this friend keeps telling you that you're not gay. What the fuck do they know? And that, you know, you like being with women more because it's more safe. How do they? What? Excuse me. This is your story to tell. This is your life to live. And they just need to butt the fuck out. It's not their business. So, uh, my advice on that would be to tell them that you find that to be hurtful and invalidating. And what you really need from them is just support and understanding. And I know that's hard. I know it's really hard for us to communicate our wants and needs to people. But that's just that that assumption is just so filled with judgment and assumption. And I just don't like it. It feels if it does, it's not supportive of you. And I want everything about that to be supportive of you and your own decisions. That's what I'm talking about the spectrum and like you deciding for you and like, hey, some people can feel this way. Some people can feel that way. Some people can switch around feeling like, oh, I thought I was gay. I think I'm bisexual. Like one of my closest, uh, not closest friends, but one of my close friends on YouTube, Michael Buckley has uh, recently, I want to say it was like a couple years ago, he had talked about how it went because he's 45 now, I think. 
he said when he was when he came out and I don't know how old he was when he came out. He was young. He said, if I knew bisexuality was an option, because back then it was like, are you gay? Or are you straight? That's how he describes his experience. Um, if I knew bisexuality was an option, I would have chose that because he's like, that's what I really think I am. OK, fair, right? For all this time in his life, he's identified as one way and he's saying, no, I think I'm this way. Who am I to get involved in that? That's his sexuality. That's his his life. That's his preference. And you get to choose. You have, you have your choice. Make your choice. Whatever you want to do, you do you. Um, and, and explain to that friend what you need from them and, and why that's hurtful. And if they can't understand, um, that tells you something too, you know? And then coming out, uh, I have a, I have a video about coming out that I did with my, one of my close friends, Rocio. Um, know that you never have to come out if you don't want to. I know people talk about it like, oh, you have to, like, as soon as you know, you have to come out. And I know that I think social media kind of fed into that and like coming out was like a big thing and people got a lot of views from it and all of this stuff. And I'm not, I'm not saying that that's bad, but I'm saying that there, there, you don't have to do that. You have to do what's best for you. You have to do what's right for you at a time that feels good for you in a way that you want to. Um, if you're worried about the faith-based stuff and that's going to upset you so much and, you know, feel like it's ruining your life, then that might not be the best, you know, you might not want to tell that person because it's your business to share. Um, I also just think coming out, I know this, I'm like, I live in a very progressive very uh, gay friendly area in Los Angeles. I feel very fortunate, but I just feel like it's almost silly to have to come out anymore. I'm like, oh, if you want to date a, a dude and you are a dude, great. If you want to date a chick and you are a chick, great. If you want to date all sorts of people and you don't identify as either of those, that's great too. I, it doesn't, why does that, how does that affect me again? Oh, it doesn't, surprise. Um, I know I'm all over the place, you guys, as per usual. <laughs> so anyways, my advice is when if you want to come out, because let's just say this is something you want to do because it's your timing and you feel good and you feel safe. I, I want you all to know, like, I want to make sure you're safe. I want to make sure you have a place to live, people who will love you and support you, and you won't be in any way put in danger, okay? Just get that out for anybody out there. Um, and then just uh, practice it. Write down kind of what you want to say, what you want to get out. What do, how do you want to express it? And kind of role play it in your head or with a close friend. Like, what do you think your family or friends are going to say? This friend who um, you know, is a faith-based thing. What, what are they going to say to you? And how, how would you want to react to that? What would be your, your thoughtful response, not reaction? That was a bad choice of words. Um, and so practice saying it a bunch of times until you feel like you can say it no matter what, because the thing about emotionally charged situations, when we go into them, um, if we haven't practiced ahead of time, we can get off topic. We can, we can forget what we want to say. Um, it can come out the wrong way where we don't say what we needed to say. We like get off on a tangent. Um, you know, I do that all the time right now. Um, but you know what I mean. So you need to practice so you feel comfortable and confident in what you want to say and what message you want to get across um, and how you want to address that faith-based stuff. I think more and more churches are coming around to uh, to accepting the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you know, if you can find some churches that support it, that's what I'm saying. Like, I feel really fortunate in LA because we have a a ton of churches that support. We have even churches that are like <clears throat> not 100% LGBTQ, but are like by and large, like very supportive. Like we have preachers who are um, in that community who have very active churches and stuff like that. So um, maybe you can find one of those for yourself, but, but yeah, think about it, practice it, role play it so that you're prepared. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Moving on. And again, just to wrap that up, your sexuality is nobody's business but your own. You get to choose what's best for you. Don't let anybody tell you that you have to decide. You have to do something at a certain time. You have to feel a certain way. Um, you just get to be you. It doesn't affect anybody else. That's what get, just kills me about this is like when people are prejudiced or judgmental in some way. I'm like, how does that even affect your life? Um, and the sexual abuse thing, as long as you're working to heal that, you'll you'll recognize whether that changed your preferences or not. I just wanted to share that I did have an experience where a patient felt that that did um, push them in that direction. Um, but again, that's not everybody. So you, you you do your own like looking and insight and tell that friend to shut up. Okay. <clears throat> and I got a frog in my throat. Okay. Question number eight. Hey, Katie, I was sexually abused when I was six years old and didn't fully awaken to it until I was around 13. Since then, all I can do is torture myself with it. 
I purposely watch programs or read things to do with these types of situations, even going as far as looking through my abuser's social media. Is there any reason for this and how can I stop? Oh my God, yes. That's why a lot of people who've been sexually abused or assaulted love a law and order SVU. It's like <sighs> our brain seeks out uh, situations that are very, very similar to try to make sense of what happened. Um, also, we can like ruminate because we don't really understand it. It's it's like, again, it's our brain's way of trying to make sense, trying to understand, trying to process, trying to help us. Um, uh, it's also the reason that some of my uh, patients and viewers have told me that after being a sexually after being sexually abused as a child, then we get into relationships that are very sexually abusive. And it, it it's it's like our brain tries to give us another chance to make it right or to do the thing that will be healing. And it never doesn't work out that way. It, it Unfortunately, it's kind of like the way that our brain is wired, but that's why therapy is so important and so key, whether that's um, EMDR, schema, parts therapy. Uh, what's the other one? Uh, bah, 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 bah. Anyway, other types of trauma work. Oh, somatic experiencing. That was the other one. Um, so it's very normal. I would reach out to someone, please, like try to find a trauma specialist or a trauma support group. There are a lot of PTSD support groups. A lot of things are online right now because of COVID. It's one of the silver linings that like, if it was hard for us to get places or afford uh, groups and stuff, prices are lower right now. Um, groups are bigger. <clears throat> there are more of them. More therapists are at home able to do these things because we don't have to, I'll be honest, a weird thing to a random side note being a therapist and wanting to run a group is difficult because your office doesn't always have space. Like my office could probably fit one, two, three, maybe four to five other people. And that's it. It's not very big. I have a couch and a like a bigger chair and then my chair. I used to have a love seat, but we switched our furniture up and <clears throat> got this nice big chair. Um, anyways, that's what we have. So I can't fit a group in my office. Um, so trying to find office space is hard, but right now we don't have to worry about it, right? We just do like, uh, we can't use Zoom because it's not HIPAA compliant, but like, let's say, I don't know, Skype or one of those telehealth uh, resources, we can make those uh, groups happen. So please get into that. Please uh, start processing. Um, I love the Courage to Heal workbook for children, you know, who've gone through sexual abuse, like when we're young as an adult, super helpful. Everything from healing, processing into how to have healthy sexual relationships when we're older. Um, yeah, you're not alone. It's very normal. It's it's because we're, our brain is seeking to understand. We can become obsessed with it because we're trying to like process it. And I promise you, once you get actual professional support to work on it, you'll be you'll feel so much better. Okay, and it will start to feel better. But it's okay. <clears throat> I guess the way to stop is really getting the help. Um, yeah, I'm talking about it. Okay. Question number nine. Hi, Katie. Sometimes I feel as if my existence doesn't matter. Regularly, I will go through bouts where all I can think about is disappearing. I don't have any enthusiasm or motivation for anything. I don't want to grow up or be faced with any inconveniences of any sort. These can be very minor. Though when looking at past achievements and memories, they hold a different type of feeling, something melancholy and saddening in a good kind of way. Like I miss that. However, I feel now I feel a void, like a hole in my chest and I, that I cannot fill. Sorry, this is a long one, but you know how I can fix this? This, I... And I know this sounds like a very simple answer to a very uh, intensive question, but the truth is it's depression. And I know that it seems like it's more than that, but I trust you. I'm just, my existence doesn't matter. Depression. Think about disappearing. Depression. Um, no enthusiasm, no motivation. Depression, depression. Um, have it like not wanting inc any inconveniences. Trust me, it's part of depression. Um, looking some melancholy, saddening, like you look at um, memories and they hold a different type of feeling. It's like uh, <clears throat> uh, inside out when sadness touches all the memories and it makes them like uh, nostalgia, melancholy. It's like depression's touched everything and it's tainted the way that you look at those. And so, um, yeah, and says so you look at something that's melancholy or saddening in a good kind of way, like you miss it. It's just depression, 100%. And I wish I could give you like a longer answer, but I would start talking to a professional, potentially consider an antidepressant, some medication, if they think, if you're open to it and a psychiatrist, you know, thinks that it's a good fit for you. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I think a lot of us, because of COVID and just the revolution that's happening with Black Lives Matter, and I honestly just feels like to me that our world has just like been set on fire and it can feel very overwhelming and our stress response is like heightened. And therefore, because of the stress response been happening for a long time, we know through research, not making this up, 
If we are in our stress response, fight, flight, freeze for a long period, it leads right into depression and anxiety. So I think we're going to see spikes in feelings like this. So you're not alone if you're out there feeling hopeless, helpless, and just completely unmotivated or unenthusiastic about life. Um, but get some help. It does get better. There are people out there that can help and support you. That's what we're here for. And unfortunately, but fortunately, in some ways, depression is very common. So most clinicians are well suited to assist you with it. Okay. And the final question, number 10. Hi, Katie. How do I stop self-sabotaging my sleep schedule? I'm anxious all day and use nighttime to distract myself on my phone for hours to get some mental quiet time. Okay, I love this question. And so many people were like, oh, good, it's not just me. That Those are the comments on this. Um, distracting yourself on your phone to get mental quiet time is actually, it's the opposite. Being on your phone is not mental quiet time. I would encourage all of you to get off social media, to get off your phone at nighttime, please, for the love of God. I personally, if you haven't noticed, haven't been on Twitter, Instagram as much as usual. I haven't even been TikToking as much. It's too overwhelming. Being distracting yourself on your phone is actually kind of like giving your brain junk food. And I don't mean that. I know eating disorder is not, I don't mean to be triggering. I just mean like it's processed, it's bad, it's fast food. It's not actually what your brain needs. I would encourage all of you to download, um, I don't know, Headspace, uh, Calm, uh, Unplug. I've done stuff with Unplug meditation over the years. They're wonderful. And do some quick meditations. I even have some guided meditations I did. I did one with, um, uh, explore.org, their YouTube channel. You can find that one. It's 15 minutes. I think you can like listen to it over and over and it's free. Um, <clears throat> that's what I want you to do when you get into bed. I want you to set up a new routine and it does not involve your phone. Put your phone in airplane mode or turn it off. I know it's going to be hard and you're going to want to check it. It's going to be like a habit. You're going to pick up your phone, you're going to look at it and then you're going to be like, oh fuck, I'm not supposed to do that. But that's why if you have it off, it's really great because when that knee jerk reaction happens, you're going to be like, oh shit, I'm not doing that right now. Okay. Or if you're using your phone to listen to the meditation, that's cool beans, that's fine, but still put it on like airplane mode so that you don't get any notifications and things like that, um, you know, or just turn off all your notifications like I do, things like that. Anyway, whatever you can do, minimize your time on your phone. I wish you wouldn't be on it at all. Um, put on a relaxing sound track or something, have it play through your speakers in another way if you have that. I know so many of us rely on our phones as like our main way to digest any media, maybe let's try to use another one. Um, <clears throat> so not doing that will help you go to sleep more quickly and stay asleep and not feel so anxious and overwhelmed because things are just fucking terrible right now, you guys. I'm feeling overwhelmed too. So don't think that you're alone. Don't think that, you know, as things open up, we're like, oh, everything's good and we're back to normal. That shit's not true. Um, so anyways, get off your phone start a new routine. I'd encourage you to incorporate like lavender scents. Like uh, Bath and Body Works has great, uh, what are they called? Aromatherapy. Uh, I think it's like just their aromatherapy line. And they have like a sleep scent. It's like lavender vanilla. I love it. There's like uh, pillow sprays that have lavender. You can even just get lavender essential oil, put it in a little spray bottle with some water, shake it up and spray it on your pillow. All of that stuff, as silly as it sounds, can really, really help. And if we get off of our phones, get off of social media, um, try some meditation, even if it's just five minutes, you know, that's great. Uh, maybe do some stretches before you go to bed, lay down, but I'm telling you, get rid of that phone. Um, there's also, I'm not a doctor, but there's all natural things like melatonin that can help. L-theanine is another vitamin that can help, um, helps calm your system down, get you to sleep more easily and kind of stop that anxiety and ruminating stuff. Yeah. And it's a work in progress. Just give yourself a chance. Keep trying it every night. Just try it again. Try it again. Like I said, it was probably a knee jerk reaction. Just pick up your phone and look at it. Um, but I'm telling you, it's like, it's not good for me. And I know it's not good for you. It's not good for anybody. Um, yeah, it's like, it's like drinking a bunch of shitty coffee right before you try to go to sleep. I feel like that because then I'll like, huh, or I'll see like one mean comment and then I won't sleep. So yeah, let's not. Let's get off that. Let's not do that. Um, okay. I think that's it. I have to hop on the, the live stream here soon. So thank you so much for listening. I love you guys so much. It's been great to have the community support during this really trying time. I hope you felt that way too. Um, Cause we're going to be in this for a little while and it's nice to know that we're in it together. Um, and I'll try to do, if I have more time, some live streams like on Instagram and stuff like that. It's just cause I'm writing the book. 
um, which I probably won't be finished with until like October. I'm sorry. Um, but it just takes time and it's hard for me to, you know, I'm only one person. I wish I had like a whole team. Uh, I'm very jealous of people who do. Um, but anyways, I love you all. Have a wonderful, wonderful week. And if you wanted to send in your question, I forgot to tell you guys this time. If you want to send in your question, I ask it in the community tab of the Opinions That Don't Matter YouTube page. So we go to the YouTube channel that this is on. Um, it'll be, you know, linked in the description. You're already, if you're watching this on YouTube, it's already, you're here. Um, so turn on your notifications for the community tab. I usually ask for your questions on Mondays or Tuesdays. Um, and I pick the ones with the most thumbs ups just because that means that, that you know, it's going to help the most people, the most uh, efficacious use of my time and question answering. And I hope that these were helpful. I hope I wasn't too off topic or rambling. Um, but great questions. Have a wonderful week. I'll see you next time. You can ask Bye. Her about your therapist or vent about your work. You can ask her about your self-esteem or why your feelings hurt. You can ask her why breakups suck or why you've hit a plateau. Inquire all those questions you've always wanted to know. Ask Kate.